So good afternoon. Uh, we have to land and to discuss some more basic aspects. Um, but nevertheless, you will see that it's quite interesting still to, to discuss these aspects. So the first aspect is that why do we wish to really have these drugs? Um, and um, one of the things is we would like to optimize the perfusion pressure to the organ. The second one is, of course, to provide some uh, cardiac support during the uh, uh, MCS run and to prevent ballooning when this can be um, the case and or um, help during weaning process. And for this, we have, of course, to use the vasopressor agents mostly, sometimes vasodilatory agents, but it's very seldom. Um, and for the uh, cardiac support, it's, of course, iontropic agents. Again, vasodilatory agents are often not very useful. Regarding the pressure we need to reach, there is quite an intense debate because we do not have exactly good data. We can look at this kind of data, and of course, Basically, it mentions that the lower the pressure, the lower the survival rate. But is it really the cause or is it just a consequence of uh, some disease that is leading to hypertension? We do not know exactly. We do not have this kind of interventional trials looking at different perfusion pressure to see whether or not one is better than the other one. But remember that in general patient, here septic patient, trying to get higher blood pressure levels was not associated with a better uh, outcome, even though uh, low pressure was indeed associated with a poor outcome. And more importantly also, there is a price to pay when you want to increase the blood pressure. Sometimes you get some advantages, so the kidney are often more happy, but you have more arrhythmias and sometimes even more acute myocardial infarction. So this is something to take into account. The second very important factor is to select the right vasopressor agent. And for this, remember that, especially when we discuss adrenergic agents, we have several receptors that are stimulated in different ways. And we just want to have stimulation of the alpha um, vascular res receptor to increase the blood pressure. And we have also stimulation of others. And remember that, especially with epinephrine, and I heard several times epinephrine word, is that indeed, it stimulates not only the beta-1, but also the beta-2, responsible for increase in heart rate and arrhythmias. And also in periphery, well, in muscle, it will increase the glycolysis and the oxygen consumption. So this is why, indeed, when you compare epinephrine to norepinephrine, especially in, in very severe shock, you have impairment, impairment in the, um, uh, in the uh, hepatosplanchnic circulation. So this is something probably we should try to prevent. For comparison of several drugs, dopamine and norepinephrine, it's obvious that dopamine is associated with some tachycardia and much more um, arrhythmic events um, than it can be with uh, norepinephrine, even though you reach exactly the same uh, blood pressure target. In terms of mortality, it seems not to be very different, but remember that this general population, and when focusing on cardiogenic shock patients, there was an impairment in the outcome in the patient treated with dopamine compared to the patient with norepinephrine. We say, okay, but these were selected patients. This is not in true life. Well, it's quite interesting to look at these data. When you experience, uh, at least in some center here in the US, shortening uh, shortage of, um, of, dope, of a norepinephrine for a given period of time, at the same time, there was an increase in mortality in these centers, proving probably that norepinephrine is really the first choice agent in these uh, conditions. What about the other genetic agents? Well, epinephrine, of course. And epinephrine in cardiac shock is leading to tachycardia, is leading to an impairment in the splanchnic perfusion, an impairment in renal perfusion, and is associated with worsening of the cardiac condition because, indeed, we have more uh, refractory shock with epinephrine in red compared to norepinephrine in blue. And also, short-term mortality is increased in these conditions compared uh, to uh, norepinephrine. So probably epinephrine is really not the best agent in these conditions. We can look, of course, at other agents like um, um, uh, other vasopressin uh, or angiotensin, but remember that the downstream mechanisms are exactly the same. So the sole difference will be receptor sensitivity, 
disposition in the vascular system and simulation of other receptors. Mortality seems to be quite the same. Perhaps at low dose there is some benefit, but other trials did not find exactly the same. Okay, these were in sepsis, but in post-cadering shark, you have also some data in looking at meta-analysis. There is less atrial fibrillation, yes, indeed, with vasopressin compared to norepinephrine. There is also less requirement of renal replacement therapy with vasopressin. But there is more digital ischemia with vasopressin. So what is exactly best, we do not know. And if you look at mortality, well, some effect, but perhaps mostly driven by low quality trials. So at the end, we do not know exactly. For Argentensin, well, we have, of course, this trial in septic shark so showing that, indeed, it is more effective to increase blood pressure. But the problem is it is the design of the trial because, indeed, we have the placebo when you don't change anything. You begin with a low pressure, and, of course, at the end, what do you expect to reach the target pressure if you give an agent versus a placebo? So what does it does beyond increasing blood pressure? Well, on the cardiovascular status, there was no difference in catechol put feeling pressure or whatever. Maybe it's nevertheless for the kidney, there could be something there because indeed it was improving kidney function in these patients. But there are still some warning signals. And the first one is indeed that there is an increase in heart rate, very similar to dopamine compared to norepinephrine here. And also, there may be some immunosuppressive effect because there were also more infections in the angiotensin group compared to the placebo. So finally, what about antropic agents? Well, we can discuss, of course, mostly levosimodal. And in carrying shock, it seems not to be really in a cohort some difference between uh, uh, levosimodal and dobutamine. And the interventional trials were negative. However, uh, for weaning patients under ECMO, it seems to be quite interesting because you have this kind of uh, cohorts showing that indeed Levosimona improves weaning and survival after um, um, ECMO for weaning. And the same is true uh, compared to, um, um, to a removal of ECLS compared to mirinone. It was more effective with levosimodon compared to mirinone alone. However, for the survival rate, there was no major difference. So still, the two seems to be quite valuable, but perhaps some slight advantage with levosimodon. And to end up, uh, this very recent trial, again showing some benefit with uh, um, uh, levosimodon compared uh, to placebo in these conditions. So in conclusion, correction of mean artery pressure is important. What exactly the target, we do not know exactly yet. Norepinephrine is the first agent. Uh, if norepinephrine is not doing the job, switch to another agent of another class, like uh, vasopressin derivative, and maybe perhaps uh, angiotensin, but we need more data in calorie shock. And anotropic agents uh, may be considered to limit uh, the ballooning and or to facilitate winning. And for facilitating winning especially, levosimodon seems to be very promising, um, at least in observational cohorts, but we need more uh, prospectively uh, randomized data in this context. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Uh, I have a question. If I, uh, maybe I can take the first then. Um, so, so great talk, and of course, getting it from the master himself, that's, that's wonderful. Now, that, when we are discussing patients with, after LVAD and, and after transplant, so supporting them with inotropes, we're particularly concerned about the pulmonary vascular resistance uh, and protecting the RV. What, is, what are the differences between the various uh, vasopressors with respect to uh, the effect on the pulmonary circulation, especially uh, with different dosing? Well, maybe at low dose, but at very low dose, epinephrine may be uh, perhaps slightly vasodilatory um, at the level of the uh, pulmonary vascular system uh, compared to norepinephrine, but higher doses, probably um, the uh, stimulation of the uh, beta on the other aspects will be probably more detrimental in these conditions. Um, if we really wish to go there, um, then we probably have to go to our anthropic stimulation, and for this probably mirinone is uh, one of the uh, um, um, attractive agents, but also levosimodon is very attractive for these conditions. The problem with levosimodon is a very long half-life, um, several days, and so, I mean, if we are sure that the patient will need some support for several days, we can indeed try this kind of agent. If we are not sure, it's probably not very good because we will, of course, stimulate the heart um, and the cardiovascular system for several days, um, even if the patient do not need it anymore. So, so but with, with, the, with the classical, uh, if the patient is hypotensive, 
uh, and, and you're looking for a vasopressor, are there differences between angiotensin II, vasopressin, uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, epinephrine, who all have base constriction So effects. between adrenergic agents and non-adrenergic agents, while vasopressin might be somewhat um, favorable for the uh, pulmonary artery pressure compared to uh, norepinephrine. Um, nevertheless, I mean, the price to pay is sometimes some uh, um, cardiac depression. So I mean, there, is, there, is, uh, there are really um, uh, mixed uh, results uh, for vasopressin on right ventricles, sometimes beneficial, sometimes detrimental. So um, we need probably um, context dependent uh, and not only drug dependent. Um, for the angiotensin, I'm not aware of data uh, really reporting specific effects on uh, uh, pulmonary vascular resistances. Talking about the levosimendin, and with respect to patients on VA ECMO, the first study you showed is the Vienna study, Zimper and, and, and the team. Yeah. That is a retrospective look with a historical cohort because they exactly. started doing yeah. it in a lot. So that's the second study you showed I didn't know about, and that is not randomized, just mm. yeah. that's interesting. Do you, do you, so if you're able to tolerate levosimendin because your blood pressure is good enough, you're probably going to do better. So I think that's the need for the randomized study. But my question is, you guys use it in Europe. If you got someone on VA ECMO, how would you start levosimendin? With what epi, because we usually have epinephrine, mm -hmm. or would it be someone who's on levosimendin, sorry, would it be someone who's on um, a balloon pump as well, or, or these are just patients, uh, you know, with just VA ECMO? So there are really two different ways to use it. I mean, the first one is uh, to, to support the heart and to prevent somewhat ballooning and not having to go to um, uh, venting uh, issues. Um, this is not the majority of the patients, and um, uh, for this, we do not have a lot of data there. Uh, some people try levosimendin early, early on. Most people do not do uh, at that stage. It's mostly used for the um, weaning attempts, and so when we think the patient begins to be weanable, um, it's not uncommon indeed to begin to uh, load the patient with levosimendin still on, on running, of course, usually the day before or uh, when we have already tried and you see that the heart is uh, uh, pumping correctly but not totally efficiently and then indeed we load the, the heart with a uh, levosimodon and then we redo the trials the next day or the day after and then you often these patients are winnable at that time. One, one question if, if in, in case of distribution shock and patient not responding to vasopressors and it's, can you speculate it's better to increase your pressures or to accept lower blood pressures than the 65? What would be better for the patient? And if you're going to say, if you're going to go to that approach, what criteria are you going to see, are you going to watch on a patient to say it is safe to do this way? I think that tolerating a lower blood pressure can be done if you are sure that the organ perfusion, including the brain, is satisfactory. So it's good to have awake patients there in these conditions. When the patient is um, under, uh, under sedation, it's much more trouble because indeed you are never sure. We use quite a lot the, the Doppler, but um, it depends if you have pulsatility or not. Without pulsatility or minimal pulsatility, it's very difficult to indeed use a transcranial Doppler. Um, otherwise, the other way to look at it is probably to use a nurse um, because indeed having good value use of nurse uh, is also a very good um, way to ensure that um, uh, the uh, oxygenation of the brain seems to be somewhat correct, even if the blood pressure is uh, a little bit lower than what you would like to have. Do you have experience with microcirculation on this patient and monitoring that in such well, kind of patient? We have, and um, but we did not publish this, but um, some group in uh, Rotterdam have published uh, some data, mostly on the um, at the time of winning, and um, w w what they have observed mostly is that you need first, but it's, it's easy to cause or an effect, we do not know. I mean, the patient with the worst microcirculation have, as usual, the worst outcome, but more interesting, um, during the winning attempt, uh, it's also demonstrated that one of the factors that was uh, predicting the winability of the patient it was indeed the preservation of the microcirculation during the winning attempt trial, uh, short screening trial, uh, compared to the patient who were not able, and the patient who were not able were not able to be weaned uh, for the other factors during the next few days. But um, for the 
this detection of the good perfusion pressure, we do not really use it as such because it's very difficult to find good threshold, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we don't have the Levozyman done in, in US, but as far as I remember, it's a very long acting. Yeah. So how do you guys m manage and deal with that? You know, like it's not like Mirinon that you can turn it off. So what we have now is that we forget about the um, bolus dose, which was indeed uh, leading to hypertension, and that was pr suggested initially in the first trials. So we just have um, a perfusion that lasts for 23, 24 hours, depending on the weight of the patient. Usually we use the ampulla, which is uh, quite expensive, so we use one, uh, one dose, which is one ampulla, so it's a, a 23, 24 hours um, infusion, and then it will last for five, six days, um, um, uh, more or less. And we, given the high cost, we still are quite um, debating whether or not it is useful. So we first, of course, try without it. And uh, if we see that the heart is a little bit so-and-so, then we decide indeed that uh, a small kick may be helpful, and then uh, levosimon are useful, uh, may be useful in some of these situations. Can I just ask, does anybody in the audience or in the panel have experience yet with ANG2 uh, in this patient population, post-VAD or transplant, who's struggling? In terms of availability and its expense, cost. yeah, cost is the biggest limit. I mean, I mean, the original work at the Cleveland Clinic, you would think we'd be positioning ourselves cost. <laughs> so I think that's the limit. Can you comment on a couple of things? Uh, we have not discussed about the weaning, just like if you're taking people out of VA ECMO upfront, do you use inotropes, number one? And what are your thoughts on mixed agents like mildenone and vaso in patients who are not tolerating blood pressures that you're trying to handle? So for the weaning, it's a little bit what we just discussed. I mean, yes, we use inotropic agents when we fail the first attempt uh, to wean without anotropic agents. Um, Milrinone uh, can be considered um, uh, uh, as well as Evocimondon. I mean, and um, um, more or less it depends a little bit on the um, um, on the severity of the disease. I mean, when it is um, a, a mild kick that you may need, then milrinone is very effective. When you have the feelings that, um, and it's just a gut feeling, uh, that this patient may need a more prolonged support than usually levosimona is better in these conditions. The concern I have is like, you're taking a snapshot when you're decannulating. You're just looking at one liter flow and you're saying that it's going to be fine. Six yeah. hours later, they may have a problem. Yeah. Can you tell me strategies of de-escalation, like some centers do from ECMO to balloon pump if it's a univentricular LV problem or ECMO to impella and things like mm -hmm. that. That's uh, because it's been a struggle because there's no weaning protocol. Mm -hmm. It's just a gut feeling. Yeah. When you go one liter and you say, okay, things are good, mm -hmm. that's just a snapshot of that particular time. Yes, we do this snapshot with uh, with ECO and uh, in in often associated with the PA catheter. And indeed, we uh, in these conditions, we we judge that um, based on the ECO finding, it seems to be reasonable based on uh, previous data published by other groups, especially the um, the group in, in Paris who have uh, some nice data about it. It's not a gut feeling. It's uh, we are doing in every patient's weaning trial before sending the patient to the operating room. Mm -hmm. And how the way we are doing that, we're reducing the ECMO stepwise with the swan in and with the echo and getting uh, complete hemodynamic measurements when the ECMO off yeah. on the patient. And we have our weaning criteria. And based on that, we are very, very rare that we're sending patients to the operating room and coming to us back because it's, we said he's weanable and coming to us back because he's not, not, not weaned. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the way we're doing it. We're doing the weaning trial two times in, 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 a, in, a in, in, a, in a time distance of 24 hours. If the patient fulfilled the weaning trial two times, there's no way that the patient is going to fail. And that we're talking about acute, acute cardiogenic shock patient, not acute on top of chronic. That's a different animal. But in acute patient, more than 90%, this protocol is valid. So I think, I think the concept of repeated trials and yes. off or equivalent off studies is the concept that's been proven in many ways in durable devices. So define off for... for yeah. Off? Yeah, define off and how long... Okay, it's taking about 45 minutes to, to 60 minutes to get the patient to get the patient to that level. Important to see, 
For what's your wedge pressure is behaving while you are weaning? Sure, sure. No, I think those, that's understood, right? If yeah. you're failing by wedge and echo and, yeah. and these things together, but but to define your, did you said ECMO off? Off for about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, 10 off. Minutes, but we give him bolus of heparin? Not, not flow 0.5, but no, off. No, 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 off, off, clamped. Right. Clamped yeah. and then. Egg, heparin, clamp, yeah. measure. All right, so. so and so two days. In that and day. Repetitive trial, two days. Uh, yes. Off, off. Off of you probably do a weaning trial mm -hmm. at one liter because if they fail at one liter they're gonna fail it off. Yeah, well yeah. it's a of protocol. Course. It's a protocol it's a saying stepwise. It's, yes, stepwise and how yeah. you define this patient remains stable defined by what? Let me ask you're you one other question. That's a, that's a term. That's the that's yes. the condition you're going to go from one step to the next step if his wedge remained at a certain level and his blood pressure remained at a certain level and your level of inotropes are low and defined by. Yes. No, primary core and 0.05 of epinephrine or lower, mm -hmm. and volume status is under control. 0.05 mix per kg of epi. Sorry? Mix, uh, 0.05 mix per kg, yeah, right, which yeah. is about two to five or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a, if you are not at each that level of inotropes and the patient, you are not, be, uh, not stable enough not to try to wean. That's an important point because in, in the ICU, yeah. we see the intensivist start epinephrine when we're gonna do a weaning trial, and often you, I tell them, could we just try without epi and then do one with epi? Because it's nice to know the unsupported state, especially in an, e in an EF that's coming back well. But, but, but I agree, it looks to be standard to put a little epi, and how much milrinone, Ali, like 0 0.25? 0.25 to 0.5 yeah. milrinone. Low dose. Yeah. Just, I think the question, weaning everyone's done, what is the doubt in some of our minds is completely stopping an ECMO for 10 minutes. Yeah. How safe it is, what is your experience? about how many times you have the circuit clot, how many times you have clot in the cannulas, and how many times you have a stroke. Very good point, and we just mentioned our data and the complications in ECMO, and we had zero complications related to giving the bolus of heparin. How much AC could you target? Uh, AC we are, we're talking about uh, PTT, about, about, about in that uh, 80, 80 80 and above. So yes, it, in that, in only in that period of time. We're giving a bolus and we're targeting 80 and higher. That's it. And then we can clamp and measure and open again. That's great to know. Uh, and you published that because uh, we are. We, 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 it's a part of that published. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we need to. I don't think we have had the guts to do that. No, we have not. That's exactly no, the point. We have not done that. <laughs> <laughs>